All right, guys, experiment number one here. Uh, and I have the notes with me that I have posted online, so it will kind of guide me as we go through this um, to make sure we're staying on the same page. Um, and again, I'll just kind of elaborate, fill in any holes, any gaps that we have that are not, you know, on the notes cover. Um, uh, but please make sure as you're going through this at any point along the line, you know, mark, mark it on the video or mark it on the slides, whatever it is. And when you have a question, we can button those up, send an email, we can start a blackboard chat or something like that to see um, the best way to answer your questions for that. Uh, so just to recall from last time, um, we talked about Fermat's little theorem. Okay. And just kind of remind us that I have that right here that if P is prime and P does not divide A, keep in mind all that means is that A and P are going to be cool prime there, then A raised to the P minus 1 is congruent to 1 mod P. Okay? And so uh, uh, the thing that we're going to be looking at uh, this time is do we need to have mod p there? Okay. And I mean, the relationship between p not dividing a again means that the GCD of a and p is going to be equal to 1. Keep that in mind. That's going to play a role here in a little bit. And I'll try to get out of the way every now and then so we can look at this. That'll play a role here um, when we go to uh, talk about what we're looking for. All right. So now the idea is that if we replace p with a composite number, um, what are we going to have? And I have a good example here to show that we don't quite always get this case. If we look at 3 raised to the uh, third, okay, and we're looking at this, I chose 4 for this one, mod 4. And so we're replacing P with this composite guy now, okay, namely 4, right? And clearly, if we look at this up here, um, I mean, if we look at the original statement, P not dividing A, 3 does not divide 4, we know that. Right? And so the, th the question we're asking ourselves is, does this still hold? Can I do 3 raised to the, namely this 3 is going to be, sorry, that's 4 minus 1 if you can't read that. This 3 is to the 4 minus 1. This 3 is just the A value that we chose here. And it turns out when we do this, 3 to the 3rd is 27, but 27 mod 4, keep in mind 27 mod 4, the easy way to look at that is to do the division algorithm. All right, uh, and a long division, and it goes in there six times, then we get a remainder of three, right? And so we got a bunch of threes floating around all over the place. This three is right here, okay? And what we're trying to hope for, actually, is um, to get a one here. And you'll see from what we talked about last time, it really simplifies, you know, looking at our congruences here and how to simplify things, that if I can make it one, one's great, because one times anything just kind of just keeps it the same. Uh, but right here, we're not getting that case here. This is not 1. Okay, This is true right here, but what we're saying is that, okay, what we tried here to generalize this to dropping this from being a prime and just using any number there um, that we're co-prime with does not work. And so our question is going to be, okay, if we want to drop that prime, uh, um, when does this congruence here, a to the k congruent to 1, modulo m, when is that satisfied? Right. We know it works when uh, p is a prime and p does not divide a, we could do that. But now we're trying to, you know, I guess strengthen this a little bit and use uh, some other, uh, relax, you know, away from prime and use some composite numbers there and see what can happen. And so we have our first proposition here. And I'll still try to keep writing big as we go through this um, so that you guys can still read it. But I understand that I have a smaller board, but uh, we'll try and work with what we can here. And so our first proposition, as we go through this, is that if a to the k is going to be a congruent to 1 mod m, that's what we want. We're interested in stuff like that. And again, we're dropping you know, p now and letting it be just a, a random natural number here. If a to the is greater than mod m for some k, so if we have that, okay, then the GCD of a and m must be one. 
Okay, so now go in the other direction. This is, this is saying f and only f. If the GCD of a and m is 1, does that mean a to the k is congruent to 1 mod m for some k? Uh, we haven't said that yet, but we're just saying if we have this, then the GCD of a and m is 1. Okay. Okay, so let's look at our proof here, okay? And as usual, we say let d be the GCD of a and m. Okay, just for simplification, so we don't have to keep writing GCD all the time. Okay, um, and keep in mind every time we have this congruence, we need to translate that into what does that mean? Okay, by hypothesis, okay, and I'll kind of abbreviate here so I can fit it on here. A to the congruent one mod m means that a to the k, okay, plus or is equal to one plus some multiple of m. Okay, so where y is in z. Okay. And all we're going to do on this one is shimmy the my to the other side. And so all that means is that a raised to the k minus my is equal to 1, right? So that's just by hypothesis what we have right there. And what we're going to do is try to pick on... Uh, we're trying to show that the GCD is going to be equal to 1, so we've got to show that D is 1, right? And if you think about this, if I'm able to show that D divides 1, then that's going to automatically mean, because D is GCD, so it's a number from 1 and above. If I divide 1, then I have to be 1. And so, since D divides A, right, because D is the GCD of A and M, okay, right here, sorry, since D is the GCD of A and M, D divides A, then that means that certainly D will divide A to the K. And this is something that we're going to keep doing over and over, we've done already. So it divides this, and D also divides, because it's the GCD of A and M, so it divides each of those. So it has to divide M, um, which means that D divides MY, and D dividing MY, D dividing A to the K, means that D divides A to the K minus MY, right, which is just 1. So since D divides 1, this means that D must in fact just be 1, right? Then we're done. I'm going to get out of the way there so we can kind of take that in. And so what we're getting at here, if we want to understand a to the k, <coughs> a to the k congruent to 1 mod m, okay, then we should be looking at values of a that are relatively prime to m. Okay, so if this holds right here, if we have that, then the GCD of a and m must be 1. Alright, and so what we're going to do is look at values, okay, if we're looking for a to the k congruent to 1 uh, mod m, we're going to look at values of a that are relatively prime to m. So we can change the modulus, again, from a prime to a composite number, and we're just going to be interested in values of A that are co-prime to M, have no common factors with M. Right? And that's going to motivate uh, uh, the definition of uh, what all this uh, phi function is. So Euler's phi function, uh, let's go ahead and get that definition up here. And make sure I write it out nice and pretty here. The number of, if you look at the definition, they'll say integers, but we're going to be looking at just natural numbers. Number of integers between 1 and, what letter am I using? I'm using an M that are relatively prime to M. That's what we're looking at. So, in other words, you pick a number between 1 and M, and that number and M are only divisible by 1. Okay, so they share no common factors. Um, it is defined by... Okay, and so our notation here is phi of m. Okay, we'll write our set builder notation in here. 
but I want to stress one thing after I write this. So this is the set of all A, okay? So a set of all guys such that 1 is less than or equal than A, and is less than, well you can put less than or equal than M, um, but some people put just less than M because M definitely will not be included in this, okay? And the GCD of A and M is equal to 1. Okay. Now, i got to be careful as we write this. Okay. It's not the set. It's the cardinality of the set. It's the number of things that are there. Okay. So, 5m is a function that goes from the natural numbers to the natural numbers, right? Um, and so, uh, let's do an example of this to make sure we're clear about this. I'll write out the set itself, but then make sure I write the cardinality uh, of it all that is the main thing we're looking at. And so let's say m is 12, okay? Then 5, 12, I'm going to write it as a set, but then I'm going to talk about, you know, the cardinality. So that's our final answer, what we mean by 5, 12. So how many, or what are the guys between 1 and 12? Okay, so we're going, what guys between 1 and 12, okay, satisfy that the GCD, okay, of that guy in 12 is equal to 1. All right. So let's just run through the list. We always have 1's there. Always, right? 2 of 12. Well, no, 2 shares a common factor of with 12 of 2. Go to 3. No, 3 and 12 have a common factor of 3. 4 doesn't work. 5 does, though, right? 5 and 12 are co-prime. 6, no. 7, yes. 7 and 12 are co-prime. 8, no. 9, no. 9 and 12. Remember, we're not saying 9 dividing 12. We're saying, do 9 and 12 have a common factor? They do, namely 3, so it's not included in our set. Uh, 10, no. 11, yes. Okay. 12, no. And that's why clearly 12, you know, a number in itself will always have a common factor, namely itself. And that's why a lot of people will just kind of get rid of that equal to because it won't matter. Um, so we have this set here. These are the only guys between 1 and 12 that are co to 12. And 5, 12 is the cardinality of this. So how many things are there is 4. Right? So phi of 12 is 4. Right, make sure we get that now. Uh, what if we look at like phi of uh, 10? Okay? And we won't write out the set this time to make sure we understand what we're talking about. So what guys between 1 and 10 are co to 10? We have 1, 3, 7, and 9, right? That turns out to be 4 also. Hopefully I got that down because I went through that in my head. So 5, 10 is 4. I want to make sure we understand. It's not the set. It's the cardinality of the set. Um, how about phi of 5? Phi of 5 would be 1, 2, 3, and 4, right? So that's going to be 4. Phi of 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, right? There's all those guys that co prime there. Phi of 11, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, right? So there's 10 of those there. And in general, what we can say is that phi of a prime number, okay? And this is going to be important. This will come up later on. Phi of a prime number is that prime number minus 1. It makes sense. Anybody that's below a prime number is going to be a co-prime that prime number, right? It can't divide that prime. Uh, so, or have no factors that divide that prime. So uh, if you want to do like, 531. 531 is going to be 30. Right? Um, let me come back here and make sure this all fits in. So hopefully you guys can see that okay. And so this is going to be something we're going to be using throughout the rest of the semester as Euler's uh, phi function here. So let's go on to the next slide here. Uh, something that we're going to need here, and it's pretty straightforward to prove this, a little lemma. So the lemma says, suppose the GCD of A and M is 1, and this, the GCD of B and M is 1. Okay? I think it's going to make sense. Um, if we have these two conditions right here, 
then that the GCD of AB and M is 1. We're not really getting any new factors, common factors we could get with M when we just multiply A and B together because A and B already don't share common factors with M, so we're not getting anything new from that. Uh, it's just a nice to kind of kind of get the proof technique down of what we want to do with this. So proof. Since the GCD of A and M is 1, and that's also going to be the GCD of B and M, right? We have, and again, anytime we write GCD of A and M, GCD of B and M is equal to 1. We've talked about before uh, linear congruence theorem, or uh, I think that's the name of our we did it with the Euclidean algorithm. That this means that A x1 plus b y1 is equal to 1, right? There are x1, y1 integer solutions here. They use an x1, y1, yeah. And b x2, oops, yeah, yeah, that's moment. I better use the different letter I did that here because I'm not confused with that b. Sorry about that. So this is a and m. We just do a and b here. This would be bx2 plus, and what letter I use here, y2, and y2 equals 1, right? So b and m here, b and m here, a and m here, a and m here, right? So we have, these two have integer solutions, so x1, y1, x2, y2, all live in z. Remember, should the GCD of A, B, and M is equal to 1, we do have that the smallest linear combination of two numbers is equal to the GCD, right? And so if we're able to write a linear combination, when I say linear combination, we're talking about integer solutions of A, B times an integer plus M times an integer equal to 1, that means that the GCD of A, B, and M is going to be 1 because 1 is the smallest positive linear combination we can get. And so all we're going to do is multiply these together. All right, just to kind of make a matchup that I wrote here, you know, I'm just going to be foiling this out here. A, B, X1, X2, plus A, M, X1, Y2, plus M, M, Y1, Y2, plus, did I miss one? B, M, sorry, I forgot that. B, M, X2, Y1, is equal to 1, right? So this times this is equal to this times this. And all I do is form this times this give you the first term. Outer AM, inner would be these two, which I accidentally wrote last here. And then last would be those two right there. So we have that equal to 1, okay? And then looking at all this down here, we have a linear combination. That's an A, B, X1, X2. Okay, plus common factor here of m, common factor of m among these three. Factor that out, m, and I'm left with a x1 y2 plus m times m y1 y2 plus m times b x2 y1 equal to 1, right? So factor out that common factor, right? And I'll come back and make sure you guys can see this, but I'm sure you're fine with it. Plus m times, and the thing is, all four of these are integers. A, m, and b are integers, so this right here, x1, x2 is an integer. Then m will have a, x1, y2 is an integer, plus m, y1, y2, an integer, plus b, x2, y1, another integer. So this dude is living in Z also. So we have a linear combination of A, B, and M equal to 1. And so that means that the GCD of A, B, and M is 1. So coming back here, I can see that. Right, and again, any questions, please, please, please write down anything that you're having trouble with. And all we're doing really in this chapter is so similar to chapter 9. Chapter 9 um, was for Maslow theorem, and we're just generalizing for Maslow theorem. And I think this was Euler who did this one. I remember it. Yes, Euler did this one. So 
you're going to see the next two things that we do here are just <clears throat> generalizing uh, the, the proofs that we did back in chapter 9. We're just using chapter 10 now uh, by dropping that p as a prime number. Okay. So our lemma, which is very similar to our lemma in chapter 9, so when it says this, it says let b1, b2, da, 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 all the way up to b sub 5m, so where m, remember, that's going to be Euler's phi function, and we're going to roll prime to m, b the integers, So this is really the set. If we do 5m, this is the set of those guys, is all it is. We have the integers uh, that are less than m and relatively prime to m. If the GCD of a and M is 1, then, remember how back in chapter 9 we said these two sets are the same, that's exactly what we're doing here. But if I take this set here and I multiply everybody by A, so B1A comma B2A comma dot 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 up to B sub 5M A, and we'll look at this mod M, this set and that set that we have up there, B1, B2, da, 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 comma, B sub 5M. We don't need to do mod M in this because it'll already be less than M, but just kind of read up here what we have here. Um, and this and this are the same lists. Possibly in a different order. Most likely in a different order. And I guess technically we could use A to be 1. And it's just the same list there. <clears throat> Alright, so. Uh, and again, clearly this proof is going to take up this board a couple times. So, if you want to pause that after we get up here or something like that to make sure you digest it properly, um, that, that's, that'd be my advice on that. Um, so, let's go through this. So, note that if B is relatively prime to M, We're up in our hypothesis, uh, GCD of A is equal to 1. Um, then AB, and I'll write this, the GCD of these is 1, which is what we just proved, right? So we have that. And um, if we go back to uh, chapter 9, you can look at that and see um, each of the numbers in the list is congruent to the other number in the list. Okay. So let's come back up here, continuing this. Okay. So each of the numbers. one number in 
the other list. B1, B2, da da da, comma, B sub 5n. So each one up there is congruent to one on the other list, okay? Um, and so all we got to do now is show that this is going to be unique, okay? So we need to show that each number in the first list is distinct. Okay, so each one of these matches up with one of those, right? Um, and so we just got to show that every number up here is distinct. In other words, that if I multiply, say, b1 by a and b2 by a, I'm not getting the same thing. In other words, it's a uniqueness among that list up there, okay? Because both of those contain 5m numbers, right? So this set up here has cardinality 5m, and also that set has cardinality 5m, right? So they both have, let's say, you know, they both have 16 numbers, but, and we know that everybody in B1A, B2A, L up to B sub 5MA is equal to some guy in the B1 through B sub 5M. We just got to show that that first list is going to be distinct. We know the second list is, okay? So how do we show distinctness? Well, we do, like, like, like our, we did with our uniqueness. We say, let B sub J times A, okay? Make sure I use the same notation that we have here. Um, and I use B sub K times A. Be two guys from this first list, right? B from the first list. And suppose they are congruent mod m. There's a difference between saying two things are congruent and saying that two things are equal. Okay? And so when we're saying that these guys are congruent, right, what we actually want to show is that b sub j is actually equal to b sub k, and so they are one and the same there. Right? Again, congruence is different than equality. Right? Uh, and to get that these two lists are exactly the same, we've got to show equality, not just congruence. Okay. So when we look at this, b sub j a congruent to b sub k a mod m, we always translate that around to our equation. So this means that if we write this out, b sub j a is equal to b sub k a, we're kind of adding more a little bit than what I have on here, plus m times... Uh, do I use an n anywhere? I hope I don't. I'll use an n then. m times n, right? That's our definition of congruence, right? And we go to that equation there. And so, if we just take this to the other side, b sub j a minus b sub k a is equal to m times n, right? This is where we're getting to when I said that m divides a times that. So, this right here means m times a natural or integer is equal to this, and so that m must divide this left-hand side, right? And we'll go ahead and factor out the a. m divides a times b sub j minus b sub k, right? So I put a, you know, fill in a little more gap than what I have right here to make sure we're okay with that. Um, but recall, the GCD of M and A is equal to 1. Right, so those two things are co-prime. And we have one of our properties before that. Uh, uh, since M divides that right-hand side, that A times B sub J minus B sub K, and M and A are co-prime, then M must divide B sub J minus B sub K. So M divides b sub j minus b sub k, right? However, if we think about this, um, it doesn't matter which one is, I mean, we know, you give me two numbers, one's going to be bigger than the other, and so b 
B sub J, B sub K, we can say that, uh, I don't know if I put on here one's bigger than, I think I called B sub J to be the bigger one, it doesn't really matter here. Um, I do have that be the bigger one here. But these two guys, right, why are they bounded in here? Remember, coming back to this original list that way, this B sub 1 through B sub 5M, those are the 5M numbers that are strictly smaller than M that are co-primed M, right? So they're strictly smaller than M. So how are you going to have two numbers less than M and M divides their difference? Well, the only way that M is going to divide this number below them is if B sub J minus B sub K. Who's the guy that everybody divides except for zero? Well, that guy, zero. Okay. Remember, M is a positive number, so we can talk about dividing zero. We're fine with that. So that difference must be zero, and therefore, B sub J, and so all we have to do is take that guy over, B sub J would equal B sub K, right? and we're done, that shows that everybody in this list is distinct, they're different, they're unique. If we have two things that are congruent up here, they actually, what we just showed here, is they had to be actually the same thing. Right? So that shows that those two lists right, that we have right there are going to be the exact same lists, it's just in a different order, just jumbles them up. Okay. Um, what we can do here with this. Let's go back to uh, let's do mod 10 because mod 10 is really easy. Okay? So let's say m is equal to 10. Okay. And 5m, I know we wrote that down as 4 last time, but let's write down the set here. It's the set 1, 3, 7, 9, right? And 5m on the card now I know that's 4. But this right here, this is B sub 1, B sub 2, B sub 3, B sub 5, 10, which is just 4, right? Just to make sure it matched up with the notation that we have right there. What we're saying is that if you give me this list, 1, 3, 7, 9, oops, and I take any number, okay, where are we? Oh, I don't erase it up here, but going back to the standard limit, if I take GCD of A and M equal to 1, so give me a number. I give me a number, I guess I'll give it to you because I don't think I'm going to give it to me right now. Give me a number between 1 and 10. Okay, it's going to be co-primed to 10. Uh, then we have like these guys down here. So let's take, uh, how about 7? GCD of 7 and 10 is 1, right? So if I multiply each one of these by 7, okay, so I do this times 7, 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 okay? But remember, this is all viewed mod m, so when I go convert this mod 10, what we're saying is we're going to get the same list, just possibly in a different order. So mod 10, 7 stays put. Mod 10 on 21, it becomes 1. Mod 10 on 49, it becomes 9. Mod 10 on 63, it becomes 3. So this list and this list are exactly the same. This is my, you know, 7 again was my a, okay? a times b sub 1. A times B sub 2, A times B sub 3, A times B sub 4. That's those guys down there, 7, 1, 9, 3. That's my A times B sub whatever that we have there, and that these guys are the exact same. Just kind of want to bring it up with an example. Hopefully we understand this a little more clear with a nice example, see how it goes, that these will always be the same list, it just possibly jumbles it around. Okay? So that's what that limit sets, and that's going to be really important. In Again, you'll notice with this proof is everything in here just mirrors Fermat's little theorem so much. And that's what we'll do next. Uh, again, we're, this is not Fermat's little theorem. This, I mean, but I mean that next we're going to mirror it by, I guess, generalizing it would be the better thing to say because Fermat's for a prime p. This is Euler's theorem, one of his many. So 
or the same sense as this. If the GCD of A and M is 1, and that's so, I mean, it's the same thing when we did for Maslow's theorem, when we said P does not divide A, that means that GCD of A is going to be 1. If the GCD of A and M is equal to 1, then A raised to the 5M is going to be congruent to 1 mod M. We wrote 5, remember if M is P, 5P we had up here earlier is P minus 1, right? A to the P minus 1 can grow to 1 mod P. Alright, so for Maslow theorem is a special case of this, right? So this is a stronger, more general theorem that we're looking at here. So walking through this proof, okay. So from the one we just did, we know that. Those two lists are the same, right? B sub 1A. I'm going to write out what I have here. There's B sub 2A dot 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 through B sub 5M A. Okay? Since those two lists are the same, that product is congruent to this product, B1, B2 dot 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 dot, B sub 5M mod M, sorry, it says mod M there, if you guys can see that, make sure it stayed on there. So we can barely see that. Uh, so we know that this list here, this, this, all the way up through this, is equal to this list, and so their products are going to be the same, just like we did from our uh, little theorem proof, right? So those are the same, and so all we have to do is reorganize things down. And this is how the book did it, and I wrote it like that. But uh, I'll tell you what, let's, since you have it the way the book has it, I'll write it out another way too here. Is that if we look at this, I have B1, B2, dot, 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 B sub phi of M times, how many times do we have A? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 5M five times, right? So A is multiplied together 5M times. And so that's just simplifying the left hand side. This is congruent to B1, B2, dot, 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 all the way up to B sub 5M mod M. And we just have one more little thing to button this up. We're pretty much there already. Just to kind of let you guys know the way that the book does it, they say, let big B equal you know, all this, which is fine if you want to do that. Um, they're trying to just do it all in one big step. But it's not too bad. Remember our cancellation property. Our cancellation property says that if we're co-primed to the modulus, we can cancel that, right? And B, all these Bs that we have right here, B1, B2, up to B sub 5 M, those are the exact guys that are less than M that are co-primed M, right? That's that exact set. So B1 is co-primed M, right? So gone. B2 is co-primed M, gone. B3 is co-primed M, gone. All the way up through B sub 5 M, they're all co-primed M. Right? So they can all cancel out. The book just says this big thing right here is big B. And so that product's going to be co-primed in, so we can cancel that out at once. And there's nothing wrong with doing it. Maybe it looks a little bit prettier canceling out that big B all at once.